<clears throat> Alright, squad. I am on 176, I believe, for Poet X. Yes. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I have some frozen grapes and water. Sorry if I'm eating during my reading. It's a beautiful day. Hope you're fantastic. <clears throat> so she just went to protect Twin from the bully that punched him. <clears throat> Let's see what happens. What we don't say, on the trade ride home, Twin steps into his feelings like they're a gated off room. I don't have visitation rights to. He spends the entire time playing chess on his phone. Twin, I know you've probably felt this way your whole entire life, but if Mommy and Poppy find out about White Boy, they will legit kill you. His fingers move a rook across the screen, attacking some imaginary opponent. Cody, not White Boy. And I know what Mommy and Poppy will say. What you're going to say, too. But I don't even know what I'm going to say. I only know I've always wanted to keep him safe. But this makes him a target, and I can't defend against the arrows I know are coming. Gay. I've always known without knowing that Twin was. We never said. I think he was scared. I think I was, too. He's Mommy's miracle. He would become her sin. I guess I hoped if I didn't ever really know, it would be like he wasn't. But maybe my silence just made him feel more alone. Maybe my silence condones the ugly things people think. All that I know is that I don't know how to move forward from this. Feeling off when Twin is mad. A part of myself rebels against the discord. It might sound dumb, and not all twins are like us, but when he's angry, it throws me off. I can't think of anything but him being upset, and I'm afraid anything I say will make him angrier. I don't even know what I did wrong. I've been fighting dudes for Twin my whole life. Why did he think I wouldn't show up at his school? Not even Amman's emoji smiley faces and links to Ja Rule's old romantic rap videos are enough to make me feel better. Rough draft of assignment number three. Describe someone you consider misunderstood by society. When I was little, Mommy was my hero, because she barely spoke English and wasn't born here. But she didn't let that stop her from defending herself. If she got cut in line at the grocery store, or from fighting to, fighting to get Twin into a genius school. Because I've never seen her ask my father for money or complain about her job because her hands will be scraped raw from work, but she still folds up to pray. When I was little, Mommy was my hero, but then I grew breasts. And although she was always extra hard on me, her attention became something else. But she wanted to turn me into the nun she could never be. Final draft of assignment number three, would I actually turn in? I've always found Nicki Minaj compelling. Although she gets a bad reputation for being overly sexual and making songs like Anaconda, I think the, per the persona she portrays in her videos is really different from who she is in real life. So the question should be, does society distinguish between who someone actually is and the alter ego they present to the public? For example, Ms. Minaj may have lyrics that some people feel are a bad influence, but then she's always tweeting people to stay in school. I also think society puts a negative spin on her music by saying she's allowing men to dictate how she raps, but a lot of her music shows a positive outlook on physical beauty. She is well-developed, and people always have a lot of negative things to say about her because of her body and how she talks about it and sex. But instead of being ashamed or writing something different, she celebrates her curves and what she wants. All that is because, is besides, the fact that she also got bars. By which I mean to say, she is very artistically talented. She's not just a great female rapper, she's a great rapper, period. Ms. Minaj has held her own on tracks with some of the best rappers in the world. She is a woman in a male-dominated world making albums that go platinum. I know she's not considered most women's role model like Eleanor Roosevelt or Mother Teresa, or even Beyonce. But I think she stands for girls who don't fit into society's cookie-cutter mold. Misunderstood? Perhaps by some. But those of us who can relate, we get her. At the end of class, Ms. Galliano brings in a student from her poetry club. He's a Puerto Rican kid I've seen around, with glasses and a kind smile. He says his name is Chris, and he invites us to join the club. Then he does a short poem using his hands and his volume to grab our attention. Ms. Galliano looks on like a proud mama bear, and the class gives half-hearted claps, and a dap or two. Chris hands out flyers for the citywide slam, and personally invites everyone to come to a poetry club meeting. The slam is three months away, February 8th. Ms. Galliano says it's open to the public, and even if we don't sign up, we should attend and support Chris and our peers, and I feel my, my face grow hot. I should be there. I should compete. When I was little, Mommy would take Twin and me ice skating every year for our birthday, January 8th. She would work the holidays to make sure she had the afternoon off. I always think of ice skating as a gift. 
and although twin is super uncoordinated, and I've always been a tank in tights, we were real good at skating. It was one thing we both did right. We took to the ice, falling only a few times, before we streamed easily in the circular rink. Mommy would post up behind the glass, never rented skates herself, just watched us turn in circle after circle. This was a tradition for years. Until one day, it just wasn't. Until Twin and I stopped asking. Until I forgot what it felt like to slice through the cold, maybe like a knife, but mostly like a girl, skating with her arms out, laughing with her brother, while her mother took pictures in the falling snow. Until I completely forgot about skating adventures, we used to go on until Aman asked me to go skating. I tell him I have to be home straight after school, and half days won't give us enough time. What about tomorrow? No school since teachers are grading exams. And I'm stuck. It is a day off, and no one when mommy, and one when mommy will be at work, so it's not like she'll know I'm not home. I begin to shake my head, and then I remember how free I felt on the ice, how wonderful it was, and I know I want Aman to see me feeling all that. Turns out Aman loves winter sports. It's the last thing I would have imagined, but he named professional snowboarders and skiers and figure skaters in the same tone reserved for his favorite rappers. X, I'm serious. Even Pops pay for a special even made Pops pay for a special TV channel so I could keep up. At first I think he's joking, but the way his eyes light up I can tell that this really is a passion of his. Maybe like my writing. A secret thing he's loved that he could never felt he could talk about. He tells me that in Trinidad he was fascinated by snow and watching the Winter Olympics was the closest he could get. And then that became a bigger love. X, I'm letting you know right now, I'm nice with the skates. Prepare to fall in love tomorrow. And my heart stutters over the word. How could I do anything but agree to the date? The next day shines perfect. I invite Twin to come along, but he only turns his back to me and keeps on pretending to sleep. He's still upset about me showing up to, my, to his school, and I'm trying to give him space. Aman is near the skate rental when I arrive, and all around us kids are walking and laughing. He holds out a pair of skates, and after we've laced up and have rented a locker, we walk awkwardly to the ice. I take a deep breath at the pain of nostalgia. So many good memories at Lasker Rink. I hope to add one more. I step onto the ice, and it all comes back to me. Aman hasn't moved, and I backward skate, slowly crooking my finger at him. I blush immediately. I'm never the one to make the first move, but he seems to like it and steps on the ice. He starts off slow, and we both face forward, skating side by side. Then it's like something comes over him. And I realize he wasn't lying. He's fucking amazing. Amon gets low and gains speed, then does turns and figure eights. I wait for him to start flipping and somersaulting, but he just slows down and grabs my hand. We skate that way for a while, then exit the rink to eat nachos. Amon, how did you learn all that? You're so, so good. He grins at me and shrugs. I came here and practiced a lot. My pops never wanted to put me in classes, said it was too soft. And now his smile is a little sad. And I think about all the things we could be if we were never told our bodies were not built for them. After skating, when Amon walks me to the train, he immediately pulls me to him. We never kiss so publicly, but with his lips on mine, I realize I want the same thing. And I know that it's stupid, too easy to run into someone from the block or one of mommy's church friends, but I just want to keep this moment going. When he tugs on my hand and pulls me even closer, I let him make me forget. Twins anger, confirmation class, the train smell, the people around us, or the stand clear of the closing doors, please. And I know people are probably staring, probably thinking, horny high school kids can't keep their hands to themselves. But I don't care because when our lips meet for those three stops before I get off, it's beautiful and real and what I wanted. We are probably the only thing worth watching anyways. Maybe we're doing our train audience a favor, reminding them of first love. This body on fire. Walking home from the train, I can't help but think Amon's made a junkie out of me. Begging for that hit, eyes wide with hunger, blood on fire, licking the flesh, waiting for the refresh of his mouth. Fiend begging for an inhale, whatever the price, just so long as it's real nice. Real, real nice. Blood on ice. Ice waiting for that warmth, that heat, that fire. He's turned me into a fiend, waiting for his next word, hanging on his last breath, always waiting for the next, next time. The shit and the fan. I hear mommy's yelling through the apartment door before I even turn the key. Which isn't right, because she shouldn't even be home yet. It isn't even four o'clock. I mean, I did miss my stop because I didn't want to quit Amon's kisses. Say Lo Estaba Comiendo had her tongue down his throat, some little dirty boy. I had to get off the train a stop early. And I know then, Mommy's eyes were a fan and my makeout session on the train was the shit hitting it. Lucky me, she's yelling from her bedroom, and I let myself into the one I share with Twin. Click the door shut and slide down to put my head between my legs. 
I don't know how much time has passed before Twin pushes open the door, and even though the wall of his silence, even through the wall of his silence, he understands something is wrong. He crouches next to me, but I can't warn him of the storm that's coming. I can't even be grateful. He's speaking to me again. I try to make all the big of me small, small, small. My parents are still yelling in the bedroom, and because I never yell back at them, I don't scream at my father when he calls me a cuero. I don't yell how the whole block whispers when I walk down the street about all the women who made a cuero out of him. But men are never called cueros. I don't yell anything because for the first time in a long time, I'm praying for a miracle, pinching myself and hoping this is all one bad dream, trying to unhear. My mother turned my kissing ugly. My father called me the names all the kids have called me since I grew breasts. God, if you're a thing with ears, please, please. Seal, what did you do now? I don't look at Twin because if I look at him, I'll cry. And if I cry, he'll cry. And if he cries, he'll get yelled at by Poppy for crying. He pushes me to stand it, then kneels in front of me again like his body doesn't know what to do. Seal? And I want to kick the fear in his voice. Seal, do they know you're home yet? Maybe you can sneak out through the fire escape. I won't tell. I'll... But Mommy's chancletas beat against the floorboards, and Twin and I both know. He pushes to his feet, and I see his hands are balled up into fists he'll never use. When the footsteps stop outside our door, I stand, brace my shoulders. I didn't do anything wrong, Twin. Go back to your homework, or your flirting, or whatever. I didn't do anything at all. Mommy drags me by my shirt to her altar of the Virgin, pushes me down until I kneel. Look at the Virgin Mary in the eye, girl. Ask for forgiveness. I bow my head, hoping to find air in the tiles. My big is impossible to make tiny, but I try to make an ant of myself. Don't make me get more rice. Mira la Santa Maria in the eye. I've learned that ants hold ten times their weight. Look at her, muchacha. Mira la. Can crawl through crevices. Have no god but crumbs. Last chance, Siomara. Santa Maria, llena eres de gracias. They will survive the apocalypse. Little brown ants and hill-building ants and fire ants, all the red and... I am no ant. My mother yanks my hair, pulling my face up from the tiles, constructing a church arch of my spine until Mary's face is an inch from mine. I am no ant, only sharply torn, something broken in my mother's hand. This is why you want to go away for college, so you can open your legs for any boy with a big enough smile? You think I came to this country for this, so you can carry a diploma in your belly but never a degree? Tu no vas a ser un maldito cuero. Cuero, she calls me to my face, the Dominican word for hoe. This is what a cuero looks like. A regular girl, pocketless jeans that draw up grown men's eyes, long hair, a nose ring, a lip ring, a tongue ring, extra earrings, any ring but a diamond one on her left hand, skirts, shorts, tank tops, spaghetti straps. A cuero lets the world know she is hot. She can feel the sun. A spectacular girl with too much ass, too much lip, too much sass, hips that look like water waiting to be spilled into the hands of thirsty boys. A plain girl, with nothing llamativo, nothing that calls attention. A forgotten girl, one who parts her hair down the middle, who doesn't have cleavage, whose mouth doesn't look like it is forever waiting. Un maldito cuero. I am a cuero, and they are right. I hope they're right. I am, I am, I am. I'll be anything that makes sense of this panic. I'll loosen myself from this painful flesh. See, a cuero is any skin. A cuero is just a covering. A cuero is a loose thing, tied down by no one fluttering and waving in the wind, flying, flying, gone. Mommy says there'll be no there be no clean in men's hands, even when the dirt has been scrubbed from beneath nails, when the soap sent from them suspends in the air, there be sins there. Their washed hands know how to make a dish rag of your spine, wring your neck. Don't look for pristine handling when men use your tears for pine soul. They'll mop the floor with your pride. There be no clean there, girl. Their fingers were made to scratch dirt to find it in the best of things. Make your heart a brio pad, brittle and steel. Don't be no damn sponge. Their fingers don't know how to squeeze nicely. Nightly, if you imagine men's kisses, soft touches, a caress. Remember Adam was made from clay that stains the hand. Remember that Eve was easily tempted. Repetition. Mommy's hard hands make me dizzy and nauseous. Mommy prays and prays while my knees bite into grains of rice. Mommy repeats herself while her statue of the Virgin watches. The whole house witnesses as I pray this steep, steep price. Things you think while you're kneeling on rice that have nothing to do with repentance. I once watched my father peel an orange without once removing the knife from the fruit. He just turned and turned and turned it like a glow being skinned. The orange peel becoming a curl. The inside exposed and bleeding. How easily he separated everything that protected the fruit and then passed the bowl to my mother, dropping that skin to the floor while the inside burst between her teeth. 
Another thing you think while you're kneeling on rice that has nothing to do with repentance. My mother has never had soft hands. Even when I was a child, they were rough, from pushing wooden mops and scrubbing tiles. Scrubbing tiles. But when I was little, I didn't mind. We would walk down the street and I would rub her calluses. She would smile and say I was her premio for hard work. I was her premio for patience. And I loved being her reward, the golden trophy of her life. I just don't know when I got too big for the appointed pedestal. The last thing you think while you're kneeling on rice that has nothing to do with repentance. How, how you will have deep grain-sized indents on your knees. How lucky you are your genes protect the skin from breaking. How you will be walking slow to school. How kneeling on pews was never as bad as this. How neither your father nor brother say anything. How you feel cold but blood has rushed to your face. How your fish are cleansed but they have nothing to hit. How the stinging pain shoots up your thighs. How you've never gritted your teeth this tight. How it hurts less if you force yourself still, still, still. How pointless these thoughts are, any of them. How cussing should never hurt this much. Twin presses a bag of frozen mixed vegetables against my knees and another against my cheek. You're so lucky, you know. She's growing old. She didn't make you kneel for very long. And with the sting still fresh on my skin, I'm not in a place to nod, but I know it's true. Seal, just don't get in trouble until we can leave. Soon we can leave for college. I've never heard twins sound so desperate. Never thought he dreamed of leaving just like me. I try not to be resentful. He skipped a grade and will escape sooner. I try not to be upset at his soft touch. I elbow him away, afraid of how my hands want to hurt everything around me. What do you need from me is such a simple question, but when Carrie Dad texts Twin the message to show to me, I look at him and hold the phone back, hand the phone back. I'm not mad that he told her. I know they're both just worried, but all I need is to give in to what I wouldn't let myself do in front of mommy. I crawl into a ball and weep. My mother drops the word no like a hundred grains of rice. I will kneel in these two. No cell phone, no lunch money, no afternoons off from church, no boys, no texting, no hanging out after school. No freedom, no time to myself, no getting out of confession with Father Sean this Sunday. Late that night, the only person I want to talk to is Amon. And although Twin offers to let me use his phone, I don't know what I'd say. That we had a great day and that it all fell apart. That my heart hurts more than my knees. That we can't be together anymore. That I won't. That I would take that beating again to be with him. Maybe there are no words to say. I just want to be held. In front of my locker... I'm so out of it the next morning as I put my things away in my locker that I don't notice the group of guys circling near until one bumps me, puts his hands, both his hands palming and squeezing my ass. And I can tell by how this boy laughs, how he smirks while saying, oops, that this was not an accident. I scan the hall. Other kids have slowed down. Some girls whisper behind their hands. The group of boys laugh, begin walking away. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a man slowing to a standstill, his smile fading. For the first time since I can remember, I wait. I can't fight today. Everything inside me feels beaten, and maybe I won't have to. Aman is here. He'll do something about it. Of course. As a boy who cares about me, he's not going to let someone touch me and make me feel so damn small inside. Of course, as someone who I've talked to about how weird it is to feel stared at and touched like pro public property, he'll know how much this bothers me. But Aman doesn't move. All the things I needed to tell him about last night, all the things that have changed since we kissed on the train, evaporate in the heat of my anger. I feel my knees throbbing. The rice bruise is pressing into the fabric of my sweats, and I think about how Amon is the reason I was punished in the first place. He's not going to throw a punch. He's not going to curse or throw a fit. He's not going to do a damn thing, because no one will ever take care of me but me. Pushing away from my locker, I face the dude who groped me. Push him hard in the back. He stumbles, but before he can react, I look him dead in the eye. If you ever touch me again, I'll put my nails through every pimple on your fucking face. I push my locker closed and grill Amon before walking away. That goes for you, too. Thanks for nothing. Part 3. The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness All of Friday and the weekend, the world I've lived in wears masking tape over its mouth. I wear invisible, beats headphones that muffle sound. I don't hear teachers or Father Sean, Twin, or Caridad. Amon tries to speak to me, in, but even in bio, I pretend my ears are cotton-filled. I speak to no one. The world is almost peaceful when you stop trying to understand it. After Mass on Sunday, under Mommy's knowing eyes, I step to Father Sean. He's kissing babies and talking to old people, but he gives me his full attention. I ask to meet him for confession, and I can't tell if I imagine it, but his eyes almost seem to get soft. He glances behind me where Mommy is standing. Instead of the confessional, he tells me to meet him in the rectory, the well-lit meeting space behind the church, and I don't know how much truth my tongue will stumble through. 
I walk through the side door and avoid looking at pictures of the saints. I'm always avoiding something, and it seems as heavy as any cross. How do you admit a thing like this? You would think I was pregnant the way my parents act like I let them down. And by my parents, I mean mommy. Poppy mostly huffs around telling me I better do what mommy says. And mommy huffs around saying I better read Proverbs 31 more closely. And I just want to tell them it's not that deep. I don't got an STD or a baby. It was just a ton in my mouth. So I'm not quite sure what to tell Father Sean when I meet him in the rectory. Maybe I don't remember my Bible right, but I don't think this is one of the seven saints. He sits across from me and crosses his ankles. Whenever you're ready, we can talk. I'm guessing you don't need anonymity, and I thought this would be cozier than the confessional. Do you want tea? I looked at my clasped hands, because I can't look at him in the face. I think I committed lust and disobeyed my parents, although they never actually said I couldn't kiss a boy on the train, so I'm not sure if that's the right sin. I wait for, my father, for Father Sean to speak, but he just stares at the pictures of the Pope above me. Are you actually sorry, Siamara? I wait a moment. Then I shake my head. No. Say, I'm sorry I got in trouble. I'm sorry I have to be here. That I have to pretend to you and her that I care about confirmation at all. But I'm not sorry I kissed a boy. I'm only sorry I was caught. Or that I had to hide it at all. Father Sean says, Our God is a forgiving God, even when we do things we shouldn't. Our God understands the weakness of the flesh. But forgiveness is only granted if the person is actually remorseful. I think this goes much deeper than kissing a boy on the train. Father Sean is Jamaican. His Spanish has a funky accent, and when he gives the gospel for the Latino mass, half of the words be sounded made up. It makes the younger kids laugh, it makes the, the older folks smile. His Spanish, when he talks to my mother, does neither. His hazel eyes are sure and gentle when he looks at mommy and tells her, Alta gracia. I don't think Siamara is quite ready to be confirmed. I think she has some questions we should let her answer first. He explains it's not what I've confessed, but several questions I've asked and comments I've made made him think I should keep coming to classes but not take the leap of confirmation this year. My mother's face scrunches tight, like someone who has vacuumed all of her joy. I avoid her eyes, but something must flash in them because Father Sean raises a hand. Alta gracia, please be calm. Remember, anger is as much a sin as any Siamara may have committed. We all need time to come to terms with certain things, don't we? And I don't know if Father Sean has just granted me a blessing or nailed my coffin shut. I can tell when mommy is really angry because her Spanish becomes faster than usual. The words bumping into one another like go-karts. Mira, muchacha, you will not embarrass me in church again. From now on, you're going to fix yourself. Do you hear me, Siamara? No te lo voy a decir otra vez. But I know she will, in fact, tell me again and again. There are going to be some big changes. Before we walk in the house, you cannot turn your back on God. I was on my journey to the convent, prepared to be his bride when I married your father. I think it was the punishment God allowed me, America, but shackled me with a man addicted to women. It was a punishment to withhold children from me for so long until I questioned if anyone in this world would ever love me. But even business deals are promises, and we still married in a church, and so I never walked away from him. Although I tried my best to get back to my first love, and confirmation is the last step I can give you. But the child sins just like the parent, because look at you choosing this over the sacred. I don't know if you're more like your father or more like me. My heart is a hand that tightens into a fist. It is a shrinking thing, like a raisin, like a too, tea, like a too tight tea, like fingers that curl but have no other hand to hold them so they just end up biting into themselves. Mi boca no puede escribir una bandera blanca. Nunca será un verso de la Biblia. Mi boca no puede formarse el lamento. Que tú dices tú y Dios merece. Tú dices que todo esto es culpa de mi boca. ¿Por qué tenía hambre? ¿Por qué era callada? Pero, ¿y la boca tuya? Como tus labios son grapas que me performan rápido y fuerte. Y las palabras que nunca dije quedan mejor muertas en mi lengua. Porque solamente hubieran chocado contra la puerta cerrada de tu espalda. Tu silencio amuebla una casa oscura, pero aún a riesgo, riesgo de camarse. La mariposa nocturna siempre busca la luz. In translation, my mouth cannot write you a white flag. It will never be a Bible verse. My mouth cannot be shaped into the apology you say both you and God deserve. And you want to make it seem like it's my mouth's entire fault, because it was hungry and silent. But what about your mouth? How your lips are staples that pierce me quick and hard. And the words I never say are better left on my tongue since they would only have slammed against the closed door of your back. Your silence furnishes a dark house. 
but even at the risk of burning, the moth always seeks the light. I never meant to hurt anyone. I didn't see how I could by stealing kisses as I whispered promises into ears that I know now weren't listening. I pretend not to see him in the hallway. I pretend not to see him at home. The ultimate actress, because I'm always pretending. Pretending I'm blind. Pretending I'm fine. I should win an Oscar, I do it so well. Is this remorse? Is this worthy of forgiveness? I lie in bed doing homework while Twin watches anime on YouTube. He has stopped wearing his headphones so that I can listen in. It's technically breaking mommy's rules, but she would never punish Twin. Halfway through an episode, a commercial endorsed by last year by one of last year's Winter Olympians comes on, and I must make a noise because Twin looks over his shoulders at me. He quiets his laptop. Are you okay? But I just bury my head in my pillow and remind myself to breathe. The next day and the one after that, I spend every class writing in my journal. Ms. Galliano sends me to the guidance counselor, but I refuse to talk to her either until she threatens to call home, so I make up an excuse about cramps and stress. Hiding in my journal is the only way I know not to cry. My house is a tomb. Even Twin has stopped talking to me, as if he's afraid a single word will cause my facade to crack. I hear Mommy on the phone making plans to send me to the Dominican Republic for the summer. The ultimate consequence. Let that good old island living fix me. Every time I think about being away from home, from English, from Twin and Caridad, I feel like a ship at sea. All the possibilities to end up anywhere I want. All the possibilities to be lost. What I'd like to tell Amon when he sends another apology message. Your hands on mine were cold. Your lips near my ear were warm. You are, I'm sorry, fervent. But you have no need to apologize. I know silence well. None of this was ever about you. You were just a failed rebellion. Of course, I'm lying. You were everything, but I can't have you without entering a fight I won't win. I know none of these were battles that I wanted in the first place. The night before Thanksgiving, Twin pulls my headphones out, offers me a sliced up apple and a soft smile. You haven't been eating much. I take the plate and stare at the fruit, surprised he's even noticed. I'm just not hungry. I ate everything but the seeds, because I know the twin is worried, and I really can't resist apples. See, Amara, can I ask you a favor? Will you write a poem about love? One about being thankful that a person is in your life? I look at my brother blankly. I wonder if he knows how close he is to having his face pierced by apple seeds. Something in my gut rebels against the apple, and I feel it wanting to come all the way back up my throat. For a second, I think of all the poems that I wrote for Amon, but I push the thought away. I shove the plated twin. You want me to write a love poem for, for your white boy? Was that what this apple was all about? Twin stares at me baffled, and then something clears on his face. He pulls my empty plate against his chest like armor. His name is Cody, and the poem was actually for you. I thought it would be cathartic to write something beautiful for yourself. I'm helping Mommy dice potatoes and beets for her hand salada rusa when the phone rings. She answers and passes it to me, and I can't imagine who it is. Caridad's voice screeches in my ear. Listen, woman, I know you're upset. I know you got a lot going on, but don't you dare ignore me for two weeks straight. Just because you got your cell taken away, you can't call nobody? And instead of getting angry, I actually tear up. It's such a small thing, but also so normal. Caridad never takes my shit, and she lets me know this time is no different. She sighs, and her voice softens. I'm worried about you, Seal. Don't shut us out. And she can't see me nodding through the phone, but I murmur an apology. And I tell her I have to go. And I know she knows I'm really saying thank you. On Thanksgiving, El Dia de Acción de Gracias, Twin and I join Mommy at church and help spoon mashed potatoes and peas and other American things we never eat at home onto homeless people's plates. I feel sick the whole day. Like everyone can see that the only thing I'm thankful for is Mommy's silence. Even Twin, who looks at me with his puppy dog face, makes me want to overturn the table and crush all these mushy peas beneath my heel. The best part about Thanksgiving was when Mommy returned my cell until I remember I've got no one to text. Rough draft of assignment number four. When was the last time you felt free? I must have been five or six because the memory is fuzzy, but my father had been watching a karate movie on TV, and my mother was at church, so there was no one to bother us. Twin and I tied long sleeve t-shirts around our heads and used the bows from my church dresses to tie like karate sashes around our waists. We thought this made us look like ninjas and we hopped from couch to couch, sliding off the plastic sofa covers but never landing in the lava. Why were we ninjas in volcanoes? Who knows? I remember at one point looking up and seeing my mother in the living room doorway. I flung myself at her. There was freedom there, in flying, in believing I'd be caught. I can't remember if she did catch me, but she must have, or wouldn't I remember falling? Rough draft of assignment number four. When was the last time you felt free? 
Maybe the last time I was happy saying a poem? With Amon listening to me, eyes half closed that moment right before I opened my mouth, when I was nervous and my heart thumped fast, but I knew I could do it anyway, that I could say something, anything, in this moment, and someone was going to listen. Rough draft of assignment number four. Can a stoop be a place of freedom? I feel like any time I sat on a stoop, I could just watch the world without it watching me too closely. Over the summer, it feels like years ago, the downstairs stoop was a playground. It was a moment when I could breathe without asking any, without asking me to do or be anything other than what I was. A girl, an almost woman, sitting in the sunshine and enjoying the warmth. Dudes don't bother you too much when you're sitting on your apartment stoop. When I sat on the stoop with the boy, I thought really cared for me. There was freedom then, too, in the ways our bodies leaned toward each other and the fact that I finally let myself be reckless. There is freedom in coming and going for no other reason than because you can. There is freedom in choosing to sit and be still when everything is always telling you to move, move fast. Final draft of assignment number four. Freedom is a complicated word. I've never been imprisoned like Nelson Mandela or some people I grew up with. I've never been encaged like a Rottweiler used for dog fights or like the roosters my parents grew up tending. Freedom seems like such a big word, something too big. Maybe like a skyscraper I've glimpsed from the foot of the building but never been invited to climb. Even lunch has now become another place I absolutely hate. A group of boys has started stopping by our quiet table, trying to squeeze in next to us or look at what the girls are drawing, or trying to sneak peeks at my notebook. These are boys from some of my classes. Some even smoke with them on. Sometimes the teacher on duty notices. If it's Ms. Galliano, I'm safe. If it's not, I have to hope it's another teacher who gives a damn about the quiet girls in the corner. I can't afford any more trouble, so I keep my hands in my lap. I keep my mouth zippered shut. And with every day, I wish I could just become a disappearing act. When Ms. Galliano returns assignment number four, I'm expecting a red zero by my name, but instead there's a note. Siamara, is everything okay? Let's talk after class. I've noticed your workmanship seems less thoughtful than usual, and you failed another quiz. See me. I try to think of the ways I can sneak out unnoticed. I have nothing to say to Ms. Galliano or anyone else. I fold the assignment sheet into small, small squares until I can squeeze it like a fortune, tightly held in the center of my palm. Ms. Galliano is sneaky. Before the bell rings, she calls me to her desk and asks me to stand with her while she dismisses the other students. And she doesn't even try to ease into the conversation, neither. What's going on? You aren't submitting your assignments, and you're even quieter than usual. Sorry, everyone. Um, but I don't have anything to tell her. If nothing else, my family believes in keeping las cosas de la casa en la casa. What happens in-house stays in-house. So I just shrug. What about Poetry Club? I keep expecting you to show up. Your writing is so good. You wouldn't even have to read. Maybe you could just come and listen, see how you feel. I almost tell her that I have a confirmation class, that the times overlap. But then I remember, Father Sean isn't expecting me to show up anymore. And, well, Mommy is. Who would know I'm skipping as long as I'm there when she picks me up? Plus, I have so much bursting to be said, and I think I'm ready to be listened to. I swallow back the smile that tries to creep onto my face, but tell Miss Galliano, I'll redo the assignment, if I can't. And I'll see you at the club tomorrow. I don't know the last time I looked forward to something. The afternoons with Amon seemed so long ago. We're in a new unit now, and Mr. Bildner has changed our lab partners. I'm with a girl named Marcy who doodles hearts over and over in her notebook. Sometimes I catch Amon looking at me from across the room. Long looks that stretch the physical space between us. And although I'm still angry that he didn't stand up for me, a part of me feels like maybe I messed up too. But even if I wanted to fix it, there's no real reason why. He and I can't have anything to do with each other. Looking back, maybe we had a parasitic relationship, one of us taking, and the other one trying to stay afloat. Maybe it's better we ended, because what can I give him? Nothing but infrequent kisses, nothing but half-done poems, nothing but sneaking around and regret at all my lying, nothing. But at least there's tomorrow. At least there's poetry. Isabel. Ain't you the big body freshman all the boys always talking about? I look at the only other person in Ms. Galliano's room. A girl in a pink tutu, and Jordans who must be some kind of mixed. Despite my sweaty hands and racing heart, I almost laugh. I don't know why I thought Poetry Club would be any different than the rest of the world. I shrug. I'm actually a sophomore. She cocks her head at me and pats the seat next to her. I'm Isabel. Who would have thought you were a poet? Dope. It's funny how the smallest, poet, the smallest moments are like dominoes lining up, being stacked with the purpose of knocking you on your ass. In a good way. I should be tight over Isabel's comment. Instead, I like how straight up she is. Most people talk about me behind my back, but she says whatever is on her mind. I don't want to get excited because who knows if I'll ever come back. 
but it seems like Ms. Galliano's small stack of posters called a cute little mix of people. We are four in total, a small club. Two boys, Chris who did a poem in my class before handing out flyers, and Stefan, who's super quiet. Then Isabel from the Bronx. Ms. Galliano walks, welcomes me to the club and asks everyone to read a poem as a way for them to introduce themselves to me. Chris and Isabel have theirs memorized, but Stefan reads from his notebook. My hands are shaking even before it's my turn, and I just keep hoping somehow I'll be skipped. Stefan's poetry is filled with the most colorful images, each line a fired visual landing on target. I don't always understand every line, but love the pictures being painted behind my eyelids. Chris Hodges is loud, a mile a minute talker, a comment for every poem. Everything is deep and wow. His own poem uses words like abyss and effervescent. Ooh, maybe. Effer effervescent. I think he's studying for the SAT. And then there's Isabel Pedamonte Riley. Her piece rhymes and she sounds like a straight up rapper. You can tell she loves Nicki Minaj too. That girl's a storyteller, writing a world you're invited to walk into. I sit wondering how writing can bring such strangers into the same room. And then it's my turn to read. I open my mouth but can't push the words out. It's not like when I read to Amon. Although I wanted him to like it, I didn't feel like I had to impress him. But right now I'm nervous. And the poem doesn't feel done yet. Or like a poem at all, just a journal entry. A fist tightens in my stomach and I take a breath, trying to unclench it. I've never imagined an audience for my work. If anything, my poems were meant to be seen and not heard. The room is so quiet and I clear my throat. Even my pause sounds too loud. Isabel speaks up. You got this, girl. Just let us hear every word. Ms. Galliano nods, and Stefan gives a soft, mm-hmm, and so I grip my notebook tight and launch into the piece. When I'm done, Isabel snaps, and Ms. Galliano smiles, and of course Chris has a comment about my poem's complex narrative structure, or something like that. I can't remember the last time people were silent while I spoke. They're actually listening. Not since Amon. But it's nice to know I don't need him in order to feel listened to. My little words feel important, for just a moment. This is a feeling I could get addicted to. You did a great job today, Siamara. I know it isn't always easy to put yourself out there like that, Miss Galliano says. And although I'm used to compliments, they're rarely ever about my thoughts, so I can't stop the smile that springs onto my face. I make sure to swallow it before it blooms too big. But it feels like an adult has finally heard me, and for the first time since the incident, I feel something close to happiness. And I want to stay and talk to the other kids or to Miss Galliano, but when I look up at the clock, I know I have to rush to church or Mommy will know that I skipped out. So instead, I just say thank you and leave without looking back. So we end on a high note. I don't know uh, where the book is going. We'll have to see. See you later, crew.